Well, good morning. How good is it to be among God's people and to be led in worship here this morning? Amen? Amen. Let's take a moment and come before the Lord and ask that he would do the work that only he could do to open our eyes to behold wondrous things from his word and to allow his word to capture our attention and our hearts and our souls here this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we are here this morning to worship you. And we praise you and we are so, so thankful for all that you are, for all that you do, and for all that you will ever be. And we bow here this morning before you. Pray that you move in our hearts. Uh, pray, Father, that uh, you will provide for us a spirit of joy, a spirit of unity, a spirit of oneness, a, a spirit of fellowship here that is so sweet that we just want to stay. Um, to, to be so sweet of a fellowship with you that we never want to leave. And so, Father, we just bring our hearts and our lives and our, our minds and our souls and our strength and all that we are, um, and we bring it to you, Father. And we worship, and we simply say here this morning, that we love you, that we so, so deeply love you. And uh, we love you, Lord Jesus, and we love you, Holy Spirit, and pray that we'll yield our lives to you here this morning and every day we ask. Guide us, <clears throat> we ask, through your word uh, so that it might encourage us and will stimulate our faith so that we will walk more rightly, um, more devoted, more authentic, more dependent for you, upon you, and with you, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, they say that confession is good for the soul. And so I have a little bit of a confession. It's a hard confession, but I need to make that confession. Um, I have a problem with, um, with something. Um, or maybe a better way to say it is that, that I struggle with. Um, I struggle, and I know you're all waiting for it, It's kind of every pastor's struggle. Um, I struggle a wee bit, as the Scottish preachers would say, just a wee bit with my ego. I, I struggle a little bit with pride. More specifically, I struggle just a little bit with bragging. I struggle just a little bit with boasting. No, I don't boast about my, my messages. I try not to. I don't boast about church attendance, which is a very hard thing to do at a pastoral conference. Because when all us pastors ask each other, well, how big is your church? Oh, we got to bite the bullet. Uh, we always want to add a few more people to the tally. Uh, I try not to do that. But I do boast about how far I can throw a football. On occasion, I'll boast about how many touchdowns I've accumulated over the course of my life or a season. I might even just boast a little bit about the fact that there was a time I could dunk a basketball. Now, I know you're all pondering that as well. That I could leave the ground and float in the air about three feet in the air for quite a bit, but I, I wouldn't want to boast about that. 
Especially right now when I have all I could do to just get my feet off the ground. But there was a time. For me, I struggle with pride. I struggle with an occasional boasting. Now, I know we're not supposed to admit that, but I don't think that I am alone. In fact, I find good company in the Apostle Paul, who had a struggle with this as well. I find great comfort in the fact that Paul needed a thorn in the flesh to keep him from boasting. I'm comforted by the fact that I'm not alone. I tried to figure out when it all started, and as best as I can trace it, it seems to track back to this thing called the fall, where pride kicked in. And then it really kicked into gear at my birth. And then it accelerated once I actually began to think. And then it exploded on the scene once I gained the capacity to put words into two sentences. The truth is, bragging really isn't a bad thing. In fact, it could be a really, really good thing. In fact, Scripture tells us that boasting can be a glorious thing. The truth be told, every Christian, every Christian should have a problem with boasting. Not because we're boasting in ourselves, but because we can't stop boasting about him. We all ought to be the world's greatest braggers as long as we are about the business of bragging on Jesus. Turn with me this morning, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want us to look at verses 26 through 31. First Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. That no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Praise God. God repeatedly calls us throughout Scripture to remember, constantly calling us to remember. We see God calling Israel to remember, to remember God's great and incredible redemption, to remember God's covenant, to remember who they were when God chose them. You weren't a large people. You were a really small group of people. You weren't mighty. Uh, You were rather pathetic. And then to remember why God chose them and what God chose them for. He's called us to be a holy people and to remember that we need him in order for that to happen. And then we see that Christ calls us to remember him. When he celebrated the Passover, he made it clear to remember his sacrifice, to remember his broken body, to remember his blood. And to always, always remember him. Why do we find those imperative commands and those imperative reminders throughout the pages of Scripture? Well, simply because we forget. We forget our deep need for him. We forget to look to him. We forget to listen to him. We forget to live for him. We forget how he's shown up time after time after time. And, or we forget to tell people all that he has done for us time after time 
after time. And sometimes we find ourselves asking the question, how in the world could a nation like Israel simply forget? I mean, how could they do that? I mean, it's one thing for us to forget, right? But they had the presence of God. They had the Shekinah glory. They had the cloud by day, the fire by night. They saw the miracles. They saw the... How in the world could they ever forget? They had the very presence of God above them, around them, leading them, protecting them. How could they forget? They forgot the same way we forget. And we have the presence of God in us. Our problem is pride. And when we become proud, we forget. And what we forget in that moment is that it's all about him. It all comes back into focus when we remember who we were when God called us to be his. When we remember who we were When he called us, we will realize that it's all about him. Paul calls us to consider our calling in Christ and who we were prior to coming to Christ. And he wants us to slow down and take a careful and deep look at who we really were. Because sometimes, after time, we forget. The Greek word blepo means to direct one's attention to something, but to consider it very, very carefully. To ponder upon it slowly, to allow it to percolate, to simmer. I like to call it crock-pot theology. To allow it to brew, to simmer. And he combines that with the Greek word klesis, which is used of an invitation or a calling to something or to someone. Paul wants us to see what condition our condition was in prior to our calling. And he simply says, not many of us were wise. Not many of us were all that brilliant. Sophos means clever. It's used of intelligence, of wisdom, of human intellect and reason. Uh, We think of the term philosophy. It's two Greek words, phileo, love, and sophos, wisdom. But combined, it's the love of wisdom. And he says, in other words, not many of you were all that bright. And then Paul narrows the definition of wisdom here, and he says, wise according to the flesh. Sarx, or sarcos, is used of the external and outward side of life, that which is natural and that which is earthly. It's used of human standards which are at odds with God and are hostile to God. Human reasoning always looks for a way to explain things away apart from God. And that human wisdom is always at odds with the wisdom of God. It is the exact antithesis. He says, not many of you were all that bright. But then he goes on to say, not many of us were mighty. In other words, not many of us were all that influential. Dunitas is used of might or power, strength, ability. One who is highly capable. It's used of one who is distinguished or one who has power in terms of position. Carries the idea of someone who has great influence in the world and great significance. In other words, not many of us were great in the world's eyes. Not many of us had any real sense of power. Not many of us were great leaders or dignitaries. Not many of us held (coughs) high-ranking positions. Certainly there were some who did, and we know that from Scripture. But those that did during Paul's lifetime certainly lost those positions once they came to faith in Christ. He says, not many of us were noble-minded. In other words, not many of us were all that superior. The word carries much more the idea of well-born or high-born, one of noble birth. 
Not many of us come from royal lineage or were born into families of great wealth and power. Not many of stature, of strength, of significance, position, or prestige. Not many of great reputation, recognition, prominence, popularity, or dignity. Dignity. If you were in England and your name was Prince Harry, you might have a certain amount of privilege. You might have a certain amount of influence. If you're a child of the queen. And with that comes a lot of privileges. But not many of us come from that kind of background. Not many of us are familiar with that. Now Paul tells us there were not many, which means there were some who were wise, there were some who were strong, there were some who were brilliant. I praise the Lord that D.A. Carson is on our side and not in the secular arena because he's absolutely brilliant. Well, there's some. There are some who came to the Lord and they were quite impressive, the Apostle Paul being one. But the rest of us, not so much. True wisdom would recognize that we were in ruins prior to Christ, empty apart from Christ. True wisdom would recognize that we have little to boast about concerning ourselves. And the reality is that without Christ and apart from Christ, we were tired, we were empty, we were alone, we were ashamed. Look at the adulterous woman. Look at the Samaritan woman. Look at a man of small stature by the name of Zacchaeus. What about Peter? A fisherman who, by all accounts, didn't always do such a great job. What about Thomas? What about Matthew, the tax gatherer? All of them had issues. What about the leper? <clears throat> the blind man? The deaf? The poor and the despised? What about a thief? hanging on a cross. What about me? What about you? What about us? We will never fully understand the depths of God's grace until we fully understand the depths of our depravity and our sinfulness and just how great our need for Christ really is when we remember who we were when he called us, we'll remember it is always about him. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, later in stages of his life in bad health and failing memory, made this statement. My memory is nearly gone, but I can remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Well, secondly, when we remember why God has chosen to choose us, we'll remember it's all about him. It all comes back into focus when we remember why God has chosen to choose us <clears throat> and why he has chosen to use us. Verse 27 begins with one of the great phrases, phrases of scripture. But God has chosen. Three times this phrase is used for emphasis in order to stress God's pursuit of us. It's in the middle voice, which is of great significance because it means God alone produces the action. God alone produces the effort. And God does so so that that action comes back to himself. God creates it, God calls us, and God is the recipient of it. He initiated, <coughs> he selects, he draws, and he chooses. 
Scripture makes it abundantly clear. Why we have, while we have a response to him, it's always God who calls. It's God who calls Adam. It's God who called Abraham. It's God who called Moses. It's God who called the kings. It's God who called the disciples. And it is the Lord who calls us. I think it's important to take notice of whom God has chosen to choose. First of all, God has chosen the foolish. Moros is used of a, of a stupid person. Uh, one who is a fool. That's where we get the English word moron. In the world's eyes, we look like idiots. Fools who believe that we have the truth. It's why the world mocks us. It's why the world makes fun of us. It's why the great leaders call Christian losers. And yet God chooses to choose us. Secondly, God has chosen the weak and the frail. The words translated feeble, miserable, frail, fatigued, and weak. The word is used to describe Paul's presence in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10, as he describes himself. And people look at him and saw him as weak, <clears throat> a man of poor stature, a man who didn't speak very well compared to Apollos and, and others. He'd be criticized for it, he'd be made fun of. But he himself uses this phrase to describe himself as the apostle who's feeble, the apostle who's frail. We as Christians oftentimes appear as those who are weak. We appear as those who are needy. We appear to those and to the world that we are frail and foolish. And certainly prior to Christ, we were absolutely without strength and frail and miserable. But God puts our trials on display and platforms them before the world as we go through the ups and downs of life. And, and sometimes, let's just face it, we look pathetic. We feel frail. But God brings us through it platforms our faith in the midst of all of that misery. Thirdly, God has chosen the insignificant <clears throat> and the despised. In other words, God has chosen to choose the failures of this world. Agonis is used of those who are lowly, insignificant. The idea of being base, not of nobility. He combines that to mean to despise or to disdain to disregard and to dispense of. Get a, get, get, let's get rid of those Christians. Let's do away with them. What they believe and what they think and how they behave. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we could just get rid of those intolerant, intolerant fools? That term is used and that language is used of Christ himself. For he was despised and forsaken of men. Jews of the Pharisee looking at the poor tax man praying. Lord, have mercy upon me, a poor sinner. Oh, what a, what a pathetic individual who needs to cry out to God. Please notice the contrast that Paul uses Foolish versus wise, weak versus mighty, despised versus noble. Look at the selection of the 12 disciples. Failures in the eyes of men. Flowing out of that, I think it's also important to note, not just whom God chose to choose, but why God chose to choose us. First of all, in order to shame the wise and the strong. In fact, it's used two times. The word literally carries the idea to humiliate and put to shame. He uses the pathetic and the weak and the frail to put to shame those who think they're all that. 
Secondly, in order to nullify the things that are not. Well, that's a little bit of a confusing statement when you think about it, but you might want to think about it this way. He does so in order to void human reasoning and human wisdom. He's chosen to choose us and use us to void human reasoning, human intellect, and human wisdom. Katargeo means to make ineffective, to make void, to nullify. It's used of the Old Testament laws that have lost their validity for Christians because of Christ. He's made it null and void because something new and better has arrived on the scene. Here's the idea. God in his wisdom takes an opposite approach to human reason. What we think is right is wrong. He exalts the humble, he dashes the proud. The strong are made weak and the weak are made strong. God takes the things of this world that seem effective and efficient and he voids them. And so what we think is right is wrong. What we think is of value in our human reasoning, in our human intellect, and in our human wisdom is not. Look at men like Bill Gates, Ted Turner who has declared all Christians are losers. And a whole host of others, men who have power, men who have money, men and women who have status, who have chosen to exist apart from God, who think that they're all that and have all that and more. Scripture would say they're fools. Look at the great minds of today, trying to outthink God, trying to think apart from God. God will bring such minds to see they are foolish, and God will bring such men and women and humanity to their knees. But there is a greater reason why God chose to choose the way in which he has. In order to make clear that no human being can stand in the presence of God and boast. The word here means to pride oneself in. To boast of oneself. And combined with the word enorion, it means in the sight of, or in the presence of, or literally, in the eye of God. That any human being would have the audacity to think within themselves. That they can stand in the presence of God, literally looking into the eyes of God. and declare that they are better than. The truth is, no human being has any right to boast before God. None of us can stand before him on our own and say that we are worthy of salvation. Not a single human soul ever. And God has designed it such a way That when we remember why he has chosen to choose us, we will remember that it is always and forever about him. There's no bragging before him, scripture tells us. And he's created it this way. This whole of this world does not make sense on the horizontal plane. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it makes that abundantly clear. Solomon spent his whole life trying to figure it out. He said, I can't make sense of it all. Because when I've exhausted all of that human wisdom, with all of my endeavor, with all of my efforts, with all of the resources at my disposal, and he had them all, trying everything he could to figure it out, he came to the conclusion at the end of it all, It does not make sense 
We think of vanity, vanity, vanity. The term would be better rendered absurdity, absurdity, absurdity. When you look at it all, it's absurd. Who worked the whole of one's life? We give it away and they blow it all. It just doesn't make any sense. And the only way it ever does is when we exhaust ourselves on the horizontal plane and we finally, finally look vertically to God. And then the light bulb goes on. And the writer of Ecclesiastes said, and God has designed it that way. That the only time it ever makes sense is when we look to him to make sense of it all. There's no bragging before him. But Paul's point here is this. My, oh my, can we boast because of him. When we remember what God has chosen to do for us, we will remember it is all about him. It all comes back into focus when we remember what God has done for us. Paul says, for it is by God's doing that we are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Paul tells us God's wisdom is displayed in righteousness. In other words, God has chosen to clothe us. The word here is used of, of righteousness that is bestowed by God to others. It means to declare right standing. It relates very closely to salvation, but it's the idea that God has declared us perfectly righteous before him. That when he sees us, doesn't see us with all this stuff. He sees us clothed in the righteousness of his son. He sees Jesus in us. We sparkle before his loving eyes. We shine in the very eyes of God. Not because of us, because of him. Not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and who we are in him. For it is by his doing that we are in Christ Jesus. Not a reference to our practical righteousness, but positional truth. Not attained by man, not obtained by works or keeping the law or doing this and doing that. Only by faith in him. Secondly, God's wisdom is displayed in sanctification. He's chosen to clothe us, but he's chosen to transform us like Christ. Hagiasmas, hagias, holy, sacred, set apart, is used of consecration. Holiness. And refers often to the process of becoming holy. Here it's the result of being made holy. There's a practical sanctification in play here. Certainly to be true, we are not perfect, but we are being perfected. What Paul is talking about here is that we are holy in the sight of God, pure, spotless, Scripture would say, blameless. Thirdly, God's wisdom is displayed in redemption. Not only has God chosen to clothe us, he's chosen to transform us, but he's chosen to free us for Christ. The word is used of an acquittal. You think of those that have been in prison crying out that maybe they have been wronged, and sometimes they haven't been wronged. Sometimes the wrong was made right. But other times, they were wronged. Maybe they're in the wrong place for the wrong reason at the wrong time. 
And they got arrested and thrown into prison. But they were innocent. Well, they cry out. They go before a judge and they're acquitted. They're set free. They're released. Bondage has been removed. Jews of pain are ransom or to redeem by purchasing. Primarily, it's used of the purchase of a slave and then setting that slave free. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1 tells us. We've been purchased. Christ paid the price to set us free. And much like the slave in the Old Testament, year of Jubilee, year of Sabbath, it would be set free. Oh, that slave would say, because I love my master, I will continue to serve him freely because I love him. Brings himself to the altar, places his ear on the altar, and it's pierced. And a slave will follow him forever. We've been set free like that. Set free from the bondage of sin because Christ came along and paid that price for us. We have the freedom. We have the freedom to move this way or that way. But we come to the altar time and time again. Because I love my master. Because he's so good to me. I bring my life to the altar. And say, Lord, pierce my heart. Pierce my life. May it be pierced the way you were pierced, so that I may follow you all the days of my life. The story is told of Abraham Lincoln. He went to visit a slave auction one day and was appalled at the sights and the sounds of the buying and selling of human souls. His heart was especially drawn to a young woman on the block whose story seemed to be told in her eyes. She looked with hatred and contempt on everyone around her. She'd been used and abused all of her life. And this time was but one more cruel humiliation. Well, the bidding began, and Lincoln offered a bid. As other amounts were bid, he counterbid with larger amounts until she was won. When he paid the auctioneer the money, and took title. Can you imagine? Took title to the young woman. She stared at him with vicious contempt. She asked him what he was going to do next with her. And he said, I'm going to set you free. Free, she asked. Free for what? Just free, Lincoln responded. Absolutely free. Free to do whatever I want to do, she asked. Yes, he said. Free to do whatever you want to do. Free to say whatever I want to say. Yeah. Free to say whatever you want to say. Free to go wherever I want to go. You are free. Free to go wherever you want to go. And then she looked at him, and the first time in a lifetime, lifetime, she began to smile. And she said, then I'm going with you. When I was saved, I remember praying. Lord, I have wasted 27 years of my life searching, trying to find it, trying to find significance, trying to find worth, trying to build it up. And I cried out to the Lord, And all that utter exhaustion and frailty. 
and said, God, if you can change my life. I don't know the whole truth. I haven't figured that out, but I believe that you're God. I know something about Jesus, but I don't know it all. But what I'm asking is you bring the truth. It's what I'm asking for. I know what it's like to live a life without you. But if you can change this poor man's life, I will live the rest of my life for you. The power of our testimony is it puts us in the moment where we remember. And I can't share mine and not choke up. Because I remember who I was when he called me. Why he chose to choose me. And I remember what he's chosen to do for me. And again and again and again I come back to the altar. And I'm reminded. It's all about him. In ministry, in academics, in business, in careers, in life. We can forget I need to go back often to remember that day, where I was, what God chose to do, and what he did for me. Yeah, I have a problem with boasting. It's a good problem to have when I remember that all boasting belongs to him. For it is by his doing we are in Christ Jesus. Nothing I can do for it, nothing I can add to it, nothing I can take from it. And nothing I can do to lose it. Because he did it all. I'm saved because of him. I'm redeemed because of him. I'm adopted because of him. I'm reconciled because of him. I am righteous because of him. I'm sanctified because of him. I'm forgiven because of him. I'll be glorified because of him. He's my propitiation. He is my great high priest. He is my mighty counselor. He's my perfect peace. He's my strength. He's my rock. He's my savior. He's my great physician. He is my life. And he is my Lord. He is my great shepherd. He is my all and my all. And he's all I will ever need. I have a problem with boasting. It's a great problem to have. Because when I'm bragging... I pray I'm bragging on Jesus. And I pray you're bragging on him as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we exalt you. And we worship you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. By your good grace, By your own doing, you've called us, you've chosen us, you use us, and you've done incredible things for us, in us, and prayerfully you will with us. In the days ahead, if we strive for anything, Father, may we strive may we strive to remember it is always and forever about Jesus. And as we do this one thing, we bring glory and honor and praise to your holy name. Help us, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen.